Okay. Let's go. There's more penalties. There's always more penalties, right? And so you can get a penalty for failing to file. You get a penalty for failure to pay. You get a penalty if there's a tax to a no. Now, now there's even more penalties, right? That we have to be careful. Of, right? The next penalty is gross valuation misstatement. Right? When this came out, this was very controversial, right? Because everybody says valuation is an opinion. How could you be penalized for having a different opinion? That's right. All right? But that's wrong. <laughs> right? The IRS has a penalty, a 40% penalty, right? So substantial understatement. If you substantially understate your tax, you got a 20% penalty. But if you understate your tax because you rely on an expert who gave you a valuation, you get a 40% tax. So picking the wrong expert is actually worse than not paying your tax. So gross valuation misstatement exists if the value of the property is more than 400% of the correct amount, right? So this comes up in charitable deductions for the most part, right? In order to make a charitable deduction of non-cash property, you have to get a qualified appraisal, right? You have to attach it to the return. You got to do your 85, 82. So you would think, I'm golden, right? I went, I hired an appraiser, and I paid. I paid, right? I can't do it myself. This is the only section of the code that says I can't prepare my own return. I can't do my own valuation. I got to hire somebody that the IRS says is a qualified appraiser. So I hire a qualified appraiser. I pay him to produce a product called a qualified appraisal. All right. So that should be good. I'm not relying on a professional. I'm not allowed to do it myself. I hired what? Meets the definition of qualified appraisal. Appraiser. And he I buy a product from him. I pay him for the product. You're golden. A I should be golden, right? <laughs> Alright. So the, the so but he's wrong. But just again, because all valuation is an opinion. So the guy has a wrong expert. opinion. You relied on an expert. Yeah, you would think that, right? I'm going to tell you, I argued that really hard. We're going to come up. And then I didn't teach it this year, and it was my case was on the exam. So I kept, I, and when I wasn't embarrassed. I just didn't feel like it was going to make the exam. So I didn't teach it to you guys. But this year, we're going to cover it. Does this pertain right. to give tax returns to? Yes. Qualified appraisal. You will learn that if your appraisal is, appraiser is wrong, you know what your recourse is? Sue the appraiser. Because you are going to get hit with the tax and the penalty. Okay. So, so the question, right? Uh, and the, the, one of the questions, this was in the exam. Taxpayer puts in an option tax shelter, right? And it's designed to generate losses, right? That's why you buy a tax shelter. Not all tax shelters are bad. But doesn't that have to have an economic interest? An economic... It's got to have substance. Right. All right, so not only do I have an appraisal, I got a nice opinion from a big law firm that says, this is good. Right? I mean, you've seen these shelter packages, right? Have ever you seen the prospectuses? They're very impressive. Right? Very nice tax opinion. They're long. They're heavy, right? Everybody got paid by the page. You know, tax benefits aren't cheap. So they, they purchase the, the option spreads. They have a package, all right? The, and essentially, it comes down that you lost. The, the taxpayer uh, contributed $3.2 million, and he took $45 million in losses. And that's the beauty of leverage, right? <laughs> <laughs> nice round numbers. 
And that's, you know, you're not going to pay for a shelter that's less than 10 to 1, right? I mean, that's the 10 to 1, 12 to 1. That's not what a good shelter is. You know, leverage. Leverage. Very good. Good shelter. So the IRS, you got a 10 to 1, and the IRS asserts the valuation penalty. Does the valuation penalty apply? <coughs> if the IRS says, look, these partnerships, they're shams. You didn't do anything. And the, the court has said that the penalties are going to apply, that the, 40, 40, the value was zero of the options, not what we claim, the $45 million loss. So they hit you with a 40% penalty. The Supreme Court of the United States said, yeah, even if the whole thing is a sham, right, which makes sense, that the, the, the value of the sham was zero. You took more than 400% of the zero. All right, so you're going to have a the Supreme Court in the United States versus one. Um, no reasonable cause penalty. All right, so prior to, nine, to 2006, the common sense answer was actually a rule. So if the question on the exam relates to a year before 2006, you rely on a qualified appraiser to produce a qualified appraisal. You pay good money. You don't know that there's anything wrong with the appraisal. You used to be golden, right? Because that was reliance on a qualified professional. After 2006, the government said that the reasonable cause exception for gross valuation misstatements, that no longer applies. And that case is Gora. Unfortunately, I'm responsible for that. That's why I didn't teach it last year. This year we're teaching. There is no reasonable cause exception for the gross valuation penalty. Your recourse is to sue the appraiser. That's it. Because the IRS says, we're not the ones who choose the appraiser. You do. So now we're putting the burden on you to choose a really good one, to produce a really good appraisal. And if your appraiser is there, then you're going to live with the consequences. Yes? Who determines the good appraiser? You do, the, the taxpayer. Well, actually, at the end of the day, it would be the court of the IRS, right? Because you're going to do the return. You know, and I've seen lots of family limited partnerships, and we do the discount, and we say, you know, we put the cash in the partnership and say, hey, there should be a 80% discount to the cash because it's in a family limited partnership. No. And I get a nice appraisal. What if we bind it in leather? <laughs> and it looks really nice. No, the reason we couldn't appeal that case is because, God, I'm going to admit this, the judge was right. The court, Congress eliminated the reasonable cause exception. I tried to argue they didn't really mean it. Oh, you know, these were really good people. And the appraiser was famous. And lots of courts had said he was the gold standard of appraisers. And then I said that hitting somebody with a penalty when they've done nothing wrong has to violate the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution because there's got to be some fault to hit somebody with a penalty. Then in that case, the, the court found that my guy, my taxpayer, he's a really good guy. And that my appraiser, he was a really smart guy. And that the appraisal was a qualified appraisal. He was just wrong. <laughs> Don't confuse me with facts. <laughs> so the court found for us, right? Every fact that you could want to go in your favor, the court said, you're right, you're right, you're right. You still got to pay the commission. <laughs> we gotta balance the budget. What's the Eighth Amendment? The right to bear arms? No, no excessive <laughs> fine or penalty shall be imposed. Okay. So we argued that imposing a fine or penalty when you did nothing wrong was by definition excessive. The court didn't buy that. They said you chose the wrong price. You lose. So this is. Uh, the, the thing to remember, valuation penalties are unique in the code. They are strict liability penalties. 
they will be imposed even in the absence of fault and even when there is reasonable it's you know usually i said the guideline always think that if the taxpayer did everything that could be expected that he's going to get out of the penalties not when it comes to valuation yes when you use a qualified appraiser Yes. Who's found to be wrong? Yes. Does he cease being a qualified appraiser? Does the IRS no. make any kind of penalty and remove him from their approved list? They, they can assert a penalty under 6694. All right. Mm -hmm. But frequently they don't. But yes, an appraiser who issues an opinion that is outside the standards of USPAP, right? What the, the standards that appraisers generally use? USPAP. Yeah, USPAP, uh, USPAP, um, can be sanctioned. It doesn't do me any good if he gets a penalty and I still get a penalty, all right? So it, it's, it, this actually discourages, you know, transactions that involve charitable contributions. This is the thing that always makes you say, you know, when I do valuations, maybe if I'm going to get a big tax deduction or there's a big valuation that reduces tax, I'm going to take discounts. I may want to get two appraisers, all right, because now this is now your strict liability area, right? They, the, the perception from the IRS and Congress is that, for lack of a better term, that appraisers were horse and that they would pay, that you would just pay them to get the opinion that you wanted so that... They basically <laughs> said, look, we, we're making, we're putting everybody on the honest track. You're wrong, you pay. Not only do you pay the tax and the interest, you pay the 40% penalty. That's a big thing. Yes? Peter. Well, on the states, the average valuation is probably lower than what you tell the Yes? Do you see anything like this? Yeah, uh, look, you're going to have... To the extent that you have a gross valuation misstatement, you could have a penalty. All right. Do you see it in? A, do you see penalties in most of the states with aggressive valuations? Sure. Sometimes, even though they say you're not supposed to do it, penalties are, in addition to compelling or punishing non-compliant conduct, it's something that they use to trade in order to get settlements. Right. So when you see lots of notice of deficiency, the term is water, right? That the, the notice of deficiency has a lot of water in it to leave room for settlement. And in estate tax cases, in valuation cases, that happens quite a bit, again, because valuations are merely an opinion. And what happens? We hire a valuation guy who says the asset has no value in an estate because we don't want to pay estate tax. The IRS hires a valuation guy who says, this was the most valuable painting on the planet. It was it was a jewel in the rough at a million dollars. It was worth a hundred million dollars. But then are they going to It's the government. <laughs> <laughs> so... Now, what else? Uh, yes, you want to add? Is it the same if it's an undervaluation or an overvaluation? Yes, that's why they call it a misstatement. Right? It depends on the tax benefit you're trying to hear, right? Because the penalty is going to be based on a 40% add on to the tax. So the tax that you tried to save, now, you, now you're going to pay the full tax, you're going to pay the interest, and then you're going to pay a 40% penalty. On top of that, 40% extra. So they think that that's enough to make you measure twice, cut once when it comes to valuations, right? Because everybody knows that if they're wrong, they're going to be sued. And if you're if you, in this business, after 2006, it became much harder. And appraisals for tax return purposes became much more expensive to get because there is so much higher risk of lawsuits if the appraiser is wrong. <laughs> right. Is it safe to take the media? No. no. Not to be safe. This is what they're telling you. There is no reasonable cause exception. So basically, there is no safe or not safe. If you're wrong, the penalty is 40%. 
All right, you got to be really wrong. It's got to be more than 400% of the right value. So just a little disagreement isn't going to result in a penalty. So you got a range. It's it's 400%. And that's in the more abusive shelters. That's in the bigger charitable contributions. That's in the, contra the, the, the contributions of land to charities for Green Acres that was already a toxic waste dump that had no value anyway. Right? It's... <laughs> I mean, you know, you read the fact patterns and you understand why Congress did what it did, because people were getting some outlandish valuations. Right, made as instructive. M A I means made as instructive. People yeah, cheap, so you know. People, it was an abuse here. Whether it's cheap, whether it's people wanted to save as much tax as they were. And then they were, you know, there were all these charitable contribution easements, right, where people would donate the front of their building. They would agree not to change the front of their building. Well, they're already in a landmark district, so they can't change the front of their building. So what did they really give away? Ice in winter. But they took big charitable contributions, right? So there, there's always some gimmick, some better mousetrap, somebody who's coming to you and saying, I can help your clients return repairs, save on their tax, and I'm only charging you 10% of the tax savings or 20% of the tax savings. Let's do it, all right? And it pervaded the industry. That's why they prosecuted all of the big four accounting firms, right? You were involved in tax shelters based on valuations, right? They prosecuted people at KPMG. They prosecuted people at uh, BDO. They prosecuted people at Ernst & Young. I mean, there were lots of prosecutions for shelters that promoted, professionals, promoters would hide behind these valuations done by appraisers in order to take tax benefits where common sense told you that really there was no economic change in position, right? And that's why the, the, the strict liability penalties were put in because nobody has the time to go over case by case, item by item. They needed to do something to say, tax professionals, stop it. It's too much of an abuse area. And in the charitable contribution area, there was. There was lots of abuse and lots of cases. All right, what else can you be penalized for? You can be penalized for taking a frivolous position or doing something just to delay, right? How many times do clients come to you and say, I just can't pay now. Delay, delay, delay. Right? Now, is that bad? You can't put a return on extension so the person can. All right, is that's a legitimate thing, right? Because co Congress has given you a statutory extension. It's not an extension to pay, it's an extension to fund. Right? This, and that's what we're going to talk about. Delays that are beyond what Congress provided for, that you, that the tax professional or taxpayer takes in order to avoid the day of reckoning, the day <coughs> where the IRS can seize your assets in order to pay taxes that have been adjudged, okay? So, so Congress has passed a statute that says, we're going to penalize you if you make frivolous arguments that really the only purpose is to delay the day of reckoning. Okay. A position is frivolous, where it's contrary to the law, unsupported by a reasoned, colorable argument for change in the law. Right? So this is the opposite of reasonable cause. In reason, uh, you know, when you, when you do a disclosure statement, you're, you've made an honest and reasonable attempt if you have a one in five chance of winning, right? So at 20% chance of success, that's still reasonable. There's no penalty if you have one, only one in chance, five chance of winning. But what happens when it goes less than that, right? When there is really no chance of winning, where you turn purple when you're making the argument to the judge, right? You can't even keep in the left. So, whenever it appears to the court 
that you've done, you started the proceeding only to delay, that your position has is frivolous or groundless, and that you haven't done what you could have done to administratively settle. You didn't go to appeals, you didn't make the good college trial to settle the case, right? Because you just didn't want to pay. So you were looking for delay. The tax court can put a penalty on the person bringing the case of $25,000, not to exceed $25,000. So we always said, look, you, you, you want to take advantage of every hearing. You want to go as long as you can. At the same time, there's a risk if you go forward when you don't have a good faith belief in the bona fides of your case. You can not only cost the taxpayer the tax, the penalty, the interest, you get, the court can actually add on another penalty of up to $25,000, right? So there are the, who can be sanctioned? The tax court practitioner can be sanctioned and be required to personally pay the cost. So it can go against the taxpayer, but the judge can also say, it's not the taxpayer. The taxpayer is bad enough. I'm going to penalize him. He's going to pay the tax. But you, tax professional, you should have known better. You passed an exam. You're entitled to practice before this court. You're now an officer of the court. You shouldn't be clogging up the court with frivolous cases. And then, so the, the judge can actually assess you personally, right? And they can actually do the same thing to the government lawyer. Right? And let me tell you, that's one of them. They, if, so, and there are times when you get frustrated with the government lawyer. Even nice people will sometimes lose their temper. And my my advice always is, before you ask penalties and sanctions against the government lawyer, think two things. One, am I retiring tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and if you shoot for the king, don't miss. <laughs> because... Asking for sanctions against the government board may feel good in this one case, right? And you may actually get them. And when you get them, that's good because then they're going to—they're not going to—they're not going to tempt the well again. But the other side of it is, they stay for a long time. They have long memories. So be sure they go right when you ask. Right. And again, why? The tax court rules to know whenever you sign something in the tax court, you are certified that it's well grounded in fact, warranted by existing law, and that it is, it is a good faith argument for extension, modification, or reversal. So you can even say, as I have on many occasions, judge, the other judge was wrong. I need you to fix it and explain why. We need to reverse the judge. Try right? one of the cases. You know that legally there was a penalty of the case on the executor. This this judge had thirty-seven times had written thirty-seven opinions saying executors will be penalized if the state tax return is lifted. There are no reasonable causes. It's a non-delegable duty. In the thirty-eighth case, so again, government say, didn't you read this judge's thirty-seven and oh? Why are you trying the case? I said, because you're not offering me anything in settlement. Now the chest is 37 and 1, right? Because he reversed. The, and so that's not for us, right? Because you thought that there was a good faith reason to change the law. Right? So the question, in a case before the tax court, tax, uh, the, the tax court imposes a penalty on the taxpayer. May the court, on its own motion, order counsel for the taxpayer to show cause why the counsel shouldn't pay the penalty. Yes. The IRS doesn't have to move. The court can impose the penalty on their own motion. Right? <laughs> so if you're trying a case, and, and this is where this comes up, right? You're trying a case, the judge wants a settlement, and then there's always the, you know, I don't think your position is all that good. You know, maybe if you go forward to trial, there could be a sanction, there could be a penalty. Generally doesn't happen, right? Because what judges try to do is resolve cases consensually. But the court can, if they believe that your position on behalf of your client 
is frivolous or not grounded in good faith, you know, uh, uh, based on existing law or an extension of, of existing law, you can be personally fined for the position that you take. Extremely, extremely rare, but this will be a question asked on every example. So the rule 33, if you're the lawyer, you're certifying it's in good faith, the court has the, the power to, to sanction everybody that appears before the court. So the, the benefit of passing the exam is that you can now appear before the tax court. The burden of passing the exam is the tax court can sanction you for any violation of its rules. Okay. So defense is dependent, right? There's lots of defenses to penalties. Penalty defense is just about as creativity, right? There, you, you have to show that something stopped the taxpayer from complying with the law, and the failure was through no fault of his own, except for the reasonable cause evaluation cases. Right. So, what do you want to always look at? You look at, did the taxpayer exercise ordinary business care and prudence in determining his or her liability? Because if they did what a reasonable person would do, then you're talking, you've got a compliant taxpayer. All right? Now, reasonable cause exceptions, uh, they always require good faith. Again, and what are we to, back to the general rule? Good faith is all that, all good faith is that he made an honest and reasonable attempt to assess their tax. So the questions that they ask. Taxpayer has non-deductible gambling losses. He claim, but he claims them as a deduction on his return. Why did he do this? Because he got a program called TurboTax. Too cheap to go to a tax preparer, right? So he went to TurboTax. It's the TurboTax case. The TurboTax defense was very popular for a while. Uh, so the, the IRS disallows the losses and adds the penalty. Taxpayer says, look, I got reasonable cause. I acted in good faith. I read the instructions in TurboTax. And TurboTax says on it, approved by the IRS. And he said, look, I don't know the law. I rely on TurboTax. So, but I didn't actually get the instructions for TurboTax because that was a couple of years ago. I don't have my that year anymore. <laughs> But I know that that's what it said, okay? Should the tax court penalize the guy or not? Absolutely. He didn't use a prepare, right? <laughs> right, because that's the cheapest, right? Again, did he do everything that an ordinary reasonable taxpayer would do? The turbo tax, reasonable cause, right? Tax preparation is only as good as the information that he puts into it. You know, the misuse of software, Right? He takes the risk, right? Because using tax software without understanding the tax, that is not reasonable. Right? And that taxpayer will be assessed the penalty. There's lots of turbo tax cases. That's right. You put on the package. But you subject to penalty. If you are wrong, you are subject to penalties like the cigarette warning label on yeah. turbo tax. <laughs> <laughs> this could be hazardous to This could be hazardous to your health. Go see a real preparer. <laughs> this could be hazardous to your wealth. See, now we're broadcasting. Now the people at TurboTax are going to send me a letter tomorrow. <laughs> we're not going to tell them. All right, they're not going to be the sponsor of the <laughs> seminar next year. TurboTax is banned some pigs, so. All right, so uh, the analysis. The TurboTax is only as good as the info going in, garbage in, garbage out. The guy didn't know the law. So reliance on software is not reasonable cause. The taxpayer has not demonstrated that he acted reasonably or in good faith. That that is on the exam. That's a that's a pro preparer case. All right, now let's get say the taxpayer. Uh, under what circumstances may a taxpayer uh, hold the taxpayer not liable if the taxpayer says I reasonably rely on the advice of a certified public accountant to prepare my returns? Sure. All right. What I'm going to go to my accountant. And I'm going to say, here's my corporate bank statements. But you know what? I deposited income into my personal account. And I'm not going to give that to my return preparer. 
So can I rely? Can I rely on the return prepared by my certified public account? Nope. I rigged the game. All right. So rigging the game is not good faith. In order to rely, right? And that because that's the common difference, right? In all of these cases, the taxpayer says, I had a return preparer prepare my return. I paid the return preparer for the return. So of course, I shouldn't get any penalty because I've exercised reasonable prudence, ordinary business care. But did I really, right? The, the reasonable cause requires that you act in good faith. The, the court cases say, what establishes good faith? One, that you hired a competent preparer, right? Somebody who's been sanctioned by the IRS for lots of prepare penalties, that's not going to be a competent preparer. Well, let's say we got it, somebody who hasn't had penalties before, right? You have to provide the tax, the preparer, with all of the information necessary to prepare an accurate return, right? And that you actually rely in good faith on the advisor's judgment. This comes up a lot on the foreign account cases, right? The, in the foreign account cases, the taxpayers are saying, my return preparer never told me that income earned in a foreign country has to be on a tax return. I come from a foreign country. I think that, hey, I pay taxes on what I earned here. Over there, that's over there. But what the, what the courts are finding is that the taxpayer did not provide the necessary and accurate information for the return preparer. Right? And that's why in many of these cases, that they will call the return preparer and say, do you have an organizer? Does your organizer say, you know, give me your foreign bank accounts? Right? That's the importance of the organizer. That's the importance of the rep letter. Right? It's important for the IRS and it's important to you to avoid penalties. Right? So the taxpayer has to rely on good faith. So competent professional, necessary and accurate information, good faith on the advisor's judgment. Those are what are required. If you can demonstrate those three things, you can avoid the understanding. Again, reliance on the appraiser, which would meet all of these standards, doesn't get you out of the misstatement penalty. This only gets you out of the understatement penalties. This only, Neil the Oncology is a defense in a criminal case, right? Because there wasn't an intentional violation of a no legal duty. If you gave all of the information to a competent professional and you relied on him in good faith. And it's also a defense to all civil penalties other than valuation penalties. Reliance on a professional is probably the most litigated and most asserted defense for all penalties. Right. What does the IRS look at? They look at what happened, when did it happen, you know, during the period of non-compliance, what what prevented the taxpayer from filing a return, paying the tax, or otherwise complying, right? This is the story that you're telling to avoid all other penalties, all right? So what else was going on at the time? You're saying I was too sick to pay my taxes. Right? Were you too sick to pay your mortgage? Were you too sick to pay your credit card bills? Were you too sick to go on vacation? Were you too sick to pay your kid's college education, right? If the only thing that isn't being paid for the taxes, then your story isn't going to resonate. You have to show that the illness permeated the entire life. <laughs> so that's why they're going to look at these things. A reasonable cause doesn't exist if you don't cure your non-compliance when the, the the thing, the challenge is eliminated. All right. So ordinary business care and, and prudence is you know providing for the rainy day. All right. How do they review it? All right. The tax credit, they look at the tax credit's reason. You, in, in every case, the IRS asserts a penalty. You're going to ask that the penalty be abated. All right. So you address the penalty. You use dates. You would put it together a timeline. All right. You show compliance history. Right. If the taxpayer has always been compliant and then the challenge stopped them from being compliant in this year, then you can ask the IRS to infer that the compliance, the non-compliance, was due to circumstances beyond their control, right? 
And there's actually a provision we're not going to cover tonight, first time penalty abates, where the IRS will abate <coughs> the taxes uh, or the penalties assessed against the taxpayer who's always been compliant and who this is the first time. Right? They look at the length of time of non compliance. Right? One return not being filed, well, that could be reasonable. Two returns, maybe. But when a guy comes in and says, well, I haven't filed since 1965. <laughs> you know, and the defense is, you know, I didn't file that first one, then I was afraid to file the others, and I've been waiting for 30 years for the IRS to get to you. Right? That is not going to resonate with this service, right? That's not going to be reasonable cause. Okay. Uh, circumstances beyond control, right? If a circumstance is beyond the taxpayer's control, that's going to be a good reason to abate any penalty. Okay? So what is beyond the taxpayer's control? All right? We've got the World Trade Center going down. That was a good one. Got lots of penalty abatements for the World Trade Center going down. Um, Hurricane Sandy, lots of you know, natural disasters are really good. But there comes a point where the natural disaster stops being good. Like saying that my, I can't pay my taxes today because of Katrina, the time has passed. <laughs> There's a reasonable period of time. Are there a lot of delay grant violates and 7508 and 7508A, that's correct. Uh, if you, that was last month's newsletter, actually. That yes, one of when you're looking at penalties, one of the things you always look at is is the taxpayer being penalized in one of the zones where the IRS granted extensions of time. And those extensions of time, uh, you know, the 7508A, 7508 is for natural disasters, 7508A, I guess, is for being in a war zone, right? Lots of military guys, you know, they have spouses and family members here, and, you know, really, they come into my office, the spouses come in and say, yeah, my husband was in Iraq or Afghanistan, I thought we would take care of filing when he got back. <laughs> that actually does work. <laughs> Um, if you're an alcoholic, that work also? No, alcoholic, not under the statute, but yes, alcoholism, certain diseases, not all of them, right? And, and you got to judge, like, is it really an addiction that has taken over the guy's life, or is it just a vice? You know, and that that's what it comes down to, drug addiction, drugs versus, you know, recreational drugs or addiction. Right? And, and that's why I look at what else has been destroyed in the guy's life. Was the guy able to go to work? Did he pay his mortgage? Did he pay his credit card bills? Did he pay everything else? All right, so let me go over this. I have one question more to do. Taxpayer uh, received, but he didn't give the account of the 1099 divs and the 1099 INTs, right? Um, and the taxpayer is prepared to return. The accountant gives the taxpayer uh, a summary of the income before he does the return. The taxpayer didn't look to see that these income items weren't there. Right? <coughs> taxpayer wants the penalties. Taxpayer says, hey, I have an accountant. He did the return. I shouldn't have a penalty. Taxpayer was confident, but the taxpayer didn't provide all the necessary information. As a result, there's no reasonable cause and that penalty will not be abated. All right, and I think that's that's what I want to cover tonight. I haven't covered the rest of it, but all penalties, that, there's a, look, there's lots of outlines tonight. There's, there's an outline that just hits the penalties that have been tested, then there's a separate outline for all the penalties you're gonna come up with in your day-to-day -day practice, right? So please read the, uh, the penalties. Ask for an abatement early and ask off. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. I'll give you a call. Thank you, sir.